why should mathematics be useful in so many different settings? Why should you be seeing the same thing so many different ways? A lot of it is there just seem to be a couple of universal principles that everything seems to evolve around. So a lot of it in physics is this minimization idea. So any physics people here? So if you look at like the path light takes, light takes the path of least time. And so if light passes from one medium to another, the angle of refraction is such that the total time it takes is minimum to get from point A to point B. And you can interpret a lot of physics in terms of this minimization idea. Uh, if you have, yeah, so we have like a little string. If you ask, you know, what curve does it take when you hang it down? Okay, oh yeah, I can say I can do better. I can do the table. So if I pull this taut, it's not surprising that this is a line. But if I have my hands loose, it's going to take this shape. Does anybody agree that this should be one and only one shape it takes? And that as I vary the points, I should get different shapes. But I shouldn't have two different choices like this. Mm -hmm. There is a way to interpret this in terms of a minimization. I believe it's the minimal surface area swept out as I spin this. And it just turns out this leads to a science called the calculus of variations, where a lot of problems can be solved like this. This question of, let's see, I, I, I should be able to get this right. So I have a mass at some point, and I want it to go to another point. And I'm going to build a curve for it to fall down on. And I want to choose the curve that will get it from here to here in the least time. And I believe this is called the Brachystone. And so this was posed by one of the Bernoulli brothers to the scientific community to see who could solve it. And only three people gave a correct solution. One, unfortunately for him, was his brother, whom he didn't like at times. Another was L'Hopital, whom you might know from calculus. And the third was an anonymous submission from England. So at the time, the great Sir Isaac Newton was, I think, Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he got the problem. And the story is he devised a new type of mathematics, essentially leading up to the calculus of variations, and sent back the proof anonymously. Uh, given that I have two double flashing lights, is it still recording? Um, it, it, it is recording. Yeah. It is not necessarily recording the audio. I don't think. Right, so I'm not sure how much of the audio is being captured. So he then sends this anonymous solution back, and the remark that Bernoulli is alleged to have said is, I recognize the lion by his paw. So going back to this slide, this is how do we count things? So these are two mirror images of the same compound. Well, okay, not quite, the, I guess not the same compound, but it has the same uh, atoms, but they're arranged in a mirror image of each other, and they will have very different properties. So we talked a little bit about this early in the semester. How will I count things like this? And so there's a lot of great counting problems you can do, and I'm going to just give you some links to papers if you're interested. So this over here, hopefully everybody recognizes the Rubik's Cube. If people ever want to learn how to solve the cube, let me know. It takes about an hour. The God number is how many moves it would take God to solve a given Rubik's Cube. So you assume that God will do things as efficiently as possible. And this is a plot of the upper bound and the lower bound of the God's number over time. And this is actually a visualization of one of the configurations that requires 20 moves. And it's now a theorem that no matter how you mix up the cube, it can be solved in 20 moves. And there are 43 quintillion different scrambles, I believe, up to symmetry for the 3 by 3 cube. So writing it out, uh, that is our number all the way down here. For the 2 by 2 cube, it's much better. There's only a little bit over 3.6 million configurations. And for each one, that's not so bad that you can't have a computer investigate them all by brute force. You've got to make sure that you really are finding the most efficient way possible but there's only a finite number of moves you can do. It's not so bad. And it's the God number for the 2 by 2 cube is 11. It's unknown what the God's number is for 4 and higher. All right, let's go to Legos. So this was a beautiful article. There are about 915 million ways of combining uh, six 2 by 4 Lego bricks. So I'm pretty sure I brought some Yes. So in the interest of time, I will only look at two of them. Okay. And we talked that we're always going to assume that they're at right angles, but there were a lot of 
hidden assumptions about what people meant when they said, how many ways can you combine six two by four bricks? Can anybody think of some of the assumptions that must have been that might have been made? So it does say on the permit there, uh, six two by four by the bricks of the same color. Right. So I think that implies an assumption that two any two bricks are interchangeable if you take any given configuration, swap two bricks, that's the same configuration. Yes. Again. So we will assume that all the bricks are the same color. But there's there was a more fundamental assumption that was made. And so the original number that Lego claimed was wrong. Probably up to symmetry. So one question is do we include symmetry or not? But there's another assumption that was being made. And again, it's very easy to make assumptions and not be aware that you're making assumptions. I guess that they're all attached to the That they're all attached. So one is that they're all attached. Another one is that it was of height six. We don't have to stack them all the way up to height six. We could have something of height two or three or four. Can't have something of height one if they're all attached. And so this is all the different ways of combining up to symmetry uh, two two by four Lego bricks. And then there's a great paper which appeared in one of the top journals in mathematics, experimental mathematics, uh, on investigations of the number of ways to combine Lego bricks. And they have recurrences, and they have upper and lower bounds, they have growth rates, but it gets very hard to find the exact number. And so here, they split things up based on the height. There's this many of height two, and there's this many of height six. And I believe this is the number that was often reported by Lego that there's 102 million ways to do it, because they just assumed you built all the way up to six. Be very careful about making assumptions. If you are doing science, you should be aware of the OEIS, the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. Out of curiosity, has anybody here ever worked with an encyclopedia that's not online? Okay, two people, oh, three, I guess I'll put my hand up. When I was in high school, I still had to learn how to use log tables and trig tables to look up things. You know, this is something that's dead, and it's quite fine with me that it's dead. So what you can do is you can input a sequence of numbers, and it will tell you anything it knows that has that as a start. So for instance, if I go, oops. Somebody give me a sequence of numbers. Um, seven, eight, one, nine, nine, seven. Nine. Uh, is that a real sequence? That's my birthday, July 8th, 1997. I, so I'm expecting that nothing, yes. So something like that is not gonna work. <laughs> give me a, a sequence of, no offense, mathematical interest. Math. All right, so if we do uh, one, do you wanna have two ones? Or one one. Let's have two ones. One, one, two, three, five. So one thousand one hundred and forty four results were found. The first one is the Fibonacci's, and it starts giving you formulas, it gives you references, it gives you a huge amount of information about them. And you know, with the Fibonacci's there's a lot that's known. And then all these references, links. And more links, more formulas. I mean, the Fibonacci is a great one. We're, yeah, we're still in the first. OK, here we go. Here's the second one. An is the number of partitions of n, the partition numbers. It starts 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, not 8. And so it, it even has your double 1. So if you just give me 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, I don't know if you're thinking Fibonacci, if you're thinking partitions. Well, I do, because you told me the Fibonacci's. So I, I do know what you're thinking. But if I didn't know that, I couldn't be sure. What I would have to do is gather more data. So this is a phenomenal website in terms of being able to gather data. And so not much is known about this sequence. We don't know that many terms. Um, I think it lists what, not even 10 terms, maybe. All right. Just want to show a few pictures from previous years. We did not do this this year because we finally succeeded. I had a dream for many years of building a Lego bridge across Koreski. And so the first year we did it, we did just a little bridge over the mantle because, uh, this is being recorded, Williams was very concerned about safety. And so we had our bridge, 
that then allowed us the second year to have a bridge spanning the distance, but just on the ground floor. And then last year, we actually were allowed to build the bridge uh, across Peresky. When we were actually constructing it, we had students in safety harnesses. And I had to promise that it would only be freshmen in safety harnesses because the seniors are so close to graduating and becoming alums and you know, being able to donate money back to this great institution. Mm -hmm. Whereas you know, a freshman, you know, they've been here, what, a couple of months? But we actually had to work with uh, safety experts to make sure that no students were lost. We had to have things cordoned off down below. If a piece fell down, we were not supposed to die for it. But in, your, in the end, we were able to span. Now in stuff like this, we have a huge advantage in that we have the ability to just build around that, and that can take a lot of, uh, of uh, pull. If you look at the first bridge over here, you can see that this is anchored going down. You could see the tower being pulled in both sides towards each other. And the students learned too late that if we were ever to do this again, do not build the towers straight up, but rather build the towers at an angle so that as you get the force pulling them together, it would actually straighten them out. Anybody know, I think it's called the Blackbird, one of the fastest planes in the US fleet? Has anybody heard of the Blackbird? Mm -hmm. I believe it's, it travels extremely fast and when it's traveling, parts of it heat up and expand. And so there are actually little gaps between things when the plane is at rest because they know when it's traveling it's gonna expand and fill that up. And they wanna make sure that there's not too much pressure on it. So you really have to take into account a lot of forces in designing something like this. All right. Uh, there's a bunch of mathematical topics. I'm not gonna go through these. If anybody's ever interested in any of these, I am happy to talk about them in greater detail. Uh, by just going like this, you can always hit pause or just look at the slides. Uh, these were just other suggestions people had for Lego ideas. And I will end with the following. So this is from 2012, I think, I'm not sure. This was the first Superstar build. We never got a good camera angle for all of this. And so for the challenge for this Friday, one of the things to think about is, you know, who can we get to come in and videotape this? We always have to put in cheesy music. So this is about 10 minutes to build the whole set. And you can notice basically no instructions, except a little bit over here, a little bit over there, but most of the people have this stuff memorized. The sad thing is you can't see the other tables where things are being done as well. Anybody know why it was a world record? First yeah, first ever attempt to be yeah, with this many people. <laughs> so if you wanna if you wanna create a world record, step one is to create a category where you have a really good chance. And so the more people you put in, the easier it's going to be. I've seen attempts of five people, and I think five people doing it in about 90 minutes. Now, with the number of people we had, there were huge amounts of time where people were idle, where we just did not have things for people to do. And so it's a really interesting question. And I, I think the build time is the wrong statistic. It's gotta be something related to build time times number of people. And you can't have somebody come in and come out. So for instance, I'm only gonna use you for you know two minutes and then you're done and you're no longer counting against us. No, if you are hired, you have to be used for the whole time. There's an issue like that uh, with the Children's Center at Williams College right now. So this is probably not applicable to any of you right now, which is a good thing, but eventually if you have children, you may be interested in daycare. And so people do not always have children at the most opportune time based on the calendars of when daycare is provided. So your contracts are often an entire year contract. Let's say the contracts start in August or September, you know, when the school year begins, but your baby is not gonna be old enough to go until December, or maybe you wanna keep the baby home for a little bit and not be ready till January. Well, a lot of times people like to have a, a job for an entire year 
and not a job just for a couple of months. That if you are hiring somebody, they need to start at the right time. So frequently, daycares uh, split essentially the difference. Say, look, we have other people who would want this space. You have a higher priority. What we'll do is we will pay for half the cost, and you pay for half the cost of the months when your child is not enrolled. And that will reserve the space for you. And then there are then very interesting questions as to what's the correct formula to use, what's the correct split. If nobody else wants the space, and you already have so many teachers that putting in an extra kid later is not gonna cost you more money by having to add another kid, I mean, having to add another teacher, that's one thing. But what if you're already at capacity and having that extra kid added means you have to hire an entirely new teacher? Because there are rules by the states as to how many kids can be in a room per teacher. For infants, it's basically three kids per one teacher. So it can be very expensive for a day kid to add one more kid. But it's also a huge service to the community. If you want the professors, if you want the staff members to be available for meetings, they often need to have care for their child. Uh, I'm a elected official in school districts. A lot of times schools will allow kids to transfer in from other districts. And if you have a classroom that can take 22 kids and it's at 17, sure, it's very easy to say let's bring in another kid or two or three. But if you're already at 22 kids, and putting in one more kid means you now have to hire a new teacher and open up a second section and go from one class of 22. Now let's say we add four kids and go up to 26 and go to two classes <coughs> of 13. It may not be worth it. And you have to really decide what's right for your district. So there's a lot of really good mathematics related to all of this. So this is the one lecture throughout the semester where the goal is to just show you a little bit where all this goes. If any of you are interested in working on a chapter in the book, let me know. Um, it has a green light approval from a major publishing house. Uh, if you are not seniors, there is even the possibility of creating an independent study to do this next year and have this as a writing intensive class. So any questions on this part right now? All right, I'm gonna hit stop.